Ah, come on down to the front of the room, please. Bring a chair. Bring a stool. Bring something soft to lie on, whatever. Just come on down the front. So a little quote from the uh, the man, Mr. Lennon, who I mentioned yesterday. The wise words of John Lennon. Well, these are probably some of the wisest words he ever said. <laughs> yeah. When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. I wrote down, happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment. And I told them they didn't understand life. Yeah, out of the, out of the mouths of babes who've been, been brought up by a very good mother. <laughs> Interesting, good stuff. I like. I, I wanted to present this so that I can situate our, um, you know, the next coming week and all that, all this FI practice into this context about life. ATM is about life. FI is about life. Probably ATM is. Oh, I'll risk it. More about life than FI. And we'll talk about that next week. But at the moment, you can uh, you can appreciate that I have a, a sort of weird, weird, blokey kind of esoteric tastes. And there was that marvelous television show that ran forever, and it just stopped a few years ago called MythBusters. Oh. But they blew up stuff and destroyed that dummy how many times? Why? To bust myths. These crazy ideas that people would come in, they say, but this is possible, and they'd bust them. But not all of them. And it was a really fun show. Um, fantastic. So uh, you, we have been busting a few myths in this segment. So I thought... I don't have the same budget as they do, but I, I can do a little, a little bit of myth busting with you. <laughs> what am I going to blow up? At the end, I will explode. No. Okay. So uh, let's let's escape, Mr. Lennon, and let's go over here. Excellent. Here we go. So, functional integration, some common assumptions. Now, some of these you've heard already. So, first one, functional integration, it's body work. A long time. <laughs> All uh, right, except when, yeah, all right, so um, functional integration, it's hands-on work. Busted. Yeah, it's, this is exactly what we've been playing with. As long as you have a relationship with a person and you've established an intent, how many ways can you play around with that intent with that person. Can be this, can be not that. All right. So next one, it's table work. It's going to get boring after a while, isn't it? 
I couldn't find any other sound effects. I was going to have sirens, but that's a bit much. So it's not table work. It's done in silence. <laughs> it ain't, except when it is. So you can, so in some of these, not all of them, but in some of them, you can say it is, but it isn't. It's that's the nature of the beastie. It depends. It depends. It's always gentle. Mm, getting dicey now. What do you reckon, emperors? Oh, okay. It's not always gentle. When you watch some of the FIs that Feldenkrais gives, they're not always gentle. Yeah. They're, um, they're specific sometimes to the person and sometimes they're specific to his mood. Who has pissed him off today? But really, I mean, that, that's, real, that's real life, right? Sometimes we carry over our states into what's happening on bad days and sometimes on good days we don't. So it's not always gentle. And to actually, for me to be able to take my stance and confront somebody with actually, um, no, that's, that's not true what you're saying about yourself. You can't say that about yourself. That's not a gentle thing to do. To help someone not to be sincere and not fraudulent. That's not always welcome. And yeah, people don't like that sometimes. That's yeah. it can be confronting. And you know, there's a certain point of argument that if it's not confronting, it's not yet a good lesson. But there's some points of view like that. That there's something, there has to be a moment of confusion of confrontation that you come to realize something. I would like that moment to be fleeting, not too painful, not too confronting, enough to pass through. Hmm. But so next one, it's never painful, sort of related. You want some emotional pain? I'll give you an example. Um, and, please, and please don't take it wrong. Uh, there was a student in a training program and she said, uh, I can tolerate pain. I said, can you? She said, oh yes, yes, I can tolerate pain. I said, are you sure? She said, are you really sure? Oh yes, I can, I can tolerate it. He said, okay, um, I'm going to pinch you. Will you let me pinch you? Yeah, 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 I can tolerate pain. So I pinched her. I pinched her really hard. And I pinched her in a very kind of martial artsy way. And she said, ow! Why'd you do that for? I said, oh, you can tolerate pain, can't you? Is she, yes, she can tolerate pain. Is it a pleasant experience? No. Does she react to it? Yes. So how do you reveal that kind of stuff? I was not on her favorite list after that for a little while. Yeah. Uh, I think sometime in the next week at lunchtime, I'll put up, um, I'll play a video of Moshe giving a lesson to a person that became his very, very good friend. Um, immense trust between them. And in this lesson, you will hear this person not quite cry out in pain, but almost beg to stop. No, 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 don't, don't. Oh! Yeah. And Moshe is going, eh, don't be a sook. But at the end of the lesson, he goes, oh, that's so much better. But there's a relationship there. Yeah. But um, I'll show you that next week sometime, at lunchtime gone sessions are a specific duration i paid for my hour can you give me an hour are they 
How long is a session? How long is a lesson? Sixty? It depends, yeah. It depends on what? Hmm. Historically, the very first lessons that Feldenkrais used to give used to last for hours, two, sometimes three hours, because he didn't know what he was doing, he was exploring. By the end, sessions were 30 minutes, five minutes for the person to come in through the door, five minutes to, for them to get ready to leave, and so the lesson would be 20 minutes. Very succinct, very precise. How? Because he had the skill. Gone. It's not a set time. There are some times that if I keep futzing around in a lesson and I go this and then that, actually they walk out more confused. I've caught myself out many a time like that. Oh, they're paying for an hour. I better keep going. When actual fact, within the first five minutes, there's a, there's a distinction there. There, It's so clear that part of me just wants to stop there. Tricky stuff. Okay, next one. The practitioner moves the person. How quick's that? Let's not discuss that. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Next one. Weekly sessions are usually sufficient. <laughs> you're going no, you're going no, you're going yeah. What do you reckon? No, you're going no at the back. Okay, there we go. Boom. It depends. There are some people that I implicitly trust. And you get a sense of them pretty quick. If I set them something, if I give them something to explore, I know that they will do it. And there are others I just know they won't do it. They just won't. And rather than them feeling guilty and me confronting them, um, I suggest that I have more sessions. I will even do deals with them to have more sessions. And what, what continuously surprises me, and I think Feldenkrais said a little bit about this the other day when he's talking about working with older people and um, people come to see me and it's like, I know they're retired. And I've inquired, you know, how much are you doing in your day? Not much. And I'm thinking, what's stopping you from coming every day? I mean, you just live around the corner, you know, you just live around. And they don't. Feldenkrais would see people five to six times a week for a long period of time. And um, the, all these things I've kind of discovered secondhand through ferreting and whatever, but that's how the, his practice was looking towards the end. So the same person five, six times a week. Yes, he would even work, he worked on the Sabbath, so he wasn't. Um, practicing Jew. Yeah. So that's busted. Lesson themes are always novel. What do you reckon about that one? Hmm? Are they always novel? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So who, from whose perspective, novel? Yeah, yeah. Did you, um, did you watch the Larry series? You watched the Larry series, yes? Were, um, every, was every lesson novel? No. There's a lot of repetition in there. A little bit different, a little bit different, but overall, same, same. Feet, 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 head, 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 middle, 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 pull, 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 see you later. More or less. 
So there's something about repetition and not always something new, completely new every time that's important for learning in a FI scenario. Yeah. Uh, so it's not always novel. <laughs> this is my favorite. It's done in a practice room. No, it's predictable, isn't it? I told you, there's no novelty in this. You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to blow it up. It's not always done in a practice room. Yeah. There have been times when absent-minded Zoran has left his office keys at home and uh, the client has shown up. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is so unprofessional. I, I, eventually, I learned to fib a little bit. I said, look, I've planned a lesson for you today. It's going to be in the park in the playground. <laughs> oh, they say. And I, I, I do. Um, sometimes after a, few, a couple of times with a couple of clients, I decided, actually, it'd be nice just to take, take somebody for a walk. Just to walk with them. And uh, so it's not always done in an office. Yeah. As you heard it um, last Monday, uh, I would do it in a studio. And I can tell you that the students that I learned the most from were the most troublesome in that studio context because they had a short attention span. They kept me on my toes. And those Aboriginal Islander students were like, yeah, they were like a honing ground, but everything was done in the studio and then on stage and then outside of the classroom and so on. Yeah, so that's it, I think. Oh, yeah, that's enough myths busted. Maybe in the week to come, you can find some more myths to bust about functional integration even about the practice of the Feldenkrais method. Because like Jenny was suggesting this morning, there's, um, there's a perception that the method is such and such. Well, maybe, but I would say that that perception is a small perception of what the overall beastie is, the old Wise man, wise men and the elephant story. You know that one. Yeah. So they got the tail end of it. And they don't even have the trunk yet. It's, it's far bigger and it's far more. And that's why I wanted to give you that article to read. That's why I suggested at the end of the day, you read that article about Feldenkrais's comments on meditation. Scathing bastard. Yeah. Really scathing. I gave that to my meditation teacher. He read it. He said, yep, he's right. <laughs> he said, he's right. And then I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. What happens if I turn the lens back on ATM practice? Actually, it's the same deal. Yeah. So it's good that we have salves and it's good that we have band-aids and you know we can it helps us to get through life but if you lose sight of john lennon's and initial thing that it's about life it's sort of a bit out of balance yeah. now having said all that we're going to do an awareness through movement lesson How do you pitch an awareness through movement lesson after something like that? Well, you can do the lesson and have those things circulating around in your life. You might have a couple of belly laughs because it's the jello pudding lesson. <laughs> yeah. I said something yesterday afternoon in the midst of your ATM. And it was about the difference between movements, learning movements and learning actions. Do you remember what I said? 
No. That's it. Yeah, you, we learn actions. We learn activities. And the control of movements comes out of that. The fact that you can lie on the floor and I can ask you, could you please bend your elbow? That came out of some activity, some real life activity that you did where you learned how to control that movement or that movement or that movement. So the, the, the control of movements is secondary. The being able to get and do an action in the world is primary. And rises the question, what's an action in the world? He's doing an action in the world right now. What's the action, Kevin? Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yep. He's thirsty. He wants to get some water. He could have asked Narayan to go and get it for him. That would be very clever. Yeah. There's many, many different ways of satisfying an action in the world. Hello. Uh, is that, that's annoying. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you know that, when you know that, it opens up vistas for functional integration and awareness through movement. Because someone comes to you and you ask them, well, what do you do in your life? And it's not a question of can you flex and extend your, your pinky. It's a question of what do you do in your life? And then they say, well, you know, I'm a mountain climber. I really love mountain climbing. And then can you see flexing and extending the pinky becomes important? Because these guys... They have to find the purchase and they literally, sorry, this is your lesson. Right? They literally, their life is suspended from this pinky. So being able to organize that is important as well as being able to pick one's nose. They both, they both involve the same set of bones, but they they live in two completely different environments. And someone might go, oh, yeah, I really like bowling. How do you hold a goal? How do you hold a bowling ball? Here. And you know, I was a I was a champion and bowler, and you know, I've got you know I've got this thing going on, and I can't control my finger anymore. And you think, so this is the craft of, for me, this is the craft of. If I thinking, I keep that image in mind. What is that image of going bowling? Where in that image can't he function? Is it just the finger? Is it just that? Is it something about the organization of the trunk and the hip? I don't know. But can you see how that creates a whole bunch of things you can explore rather than just the flexion and the extension of the little finger? And this is why the conversation this morning about yoga was so interesting for me. So coming from a, coming from a dance background, there are some dance styles that are so specific in the way you have to move, you don't have much wiggle room. Yeah? And they're not always Western. Some of the Indian dance styles are far more specific, you know, with the Balinese dance and the angle of the arm and the shoulder and this little thing that they do with the finger and the eyes. It's so specific. You have a master standing behind you actually shaping you to do this. And unless it's done well, those people who know that style, nah, not yet. I perceive yoga as very similar. An asana has a very particular form. And somehow, over time, you have to fit yourself into that form. And when you say micro-movements, it is. In that form, you can afford little micro-movements. Yeah, and anthropologists call this action systems that like language 
human beings have developed all these particular ways to use the body for art, for war, for lovemaking, the Kama Sutra. Yeah, we have all these ways that we learned to use the body. The, the most open, of course, is, you know, like Kevin, he's going to go thirsty, he's going to get himself a drink of water. That's pretty open. How many ways can you do that? Well, as many as you can think of. You can go out the door, back out, round around the building, come back, poop, but, yeah, whatever. But in awareness through movement, that kind of all changes. All that meaningful stuff for a moment or two disappears. Why? For a very specific reason. People, it, it's far easier to change a habit when you're not dragging around the idea that you have to change the habit. It's like this big bag. So if the person doesn't know that that lesson is about their habit, then they're not, they haven't picked up the bag. In Sydney, I call this, you abstract the movements out of their context and that created some confusion. So that's why this talk here, yeah. You don't specify what it's about, except when you have to market your course and you say it's about walking and it's like, oh, it's about walking. But I, I can't walk. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, so this is where creative, creative titles are, are really important. And your descriptions um, are important too. But So in, in awareness through movement, you abstract it out. I would say that it's not so much the case in functional integration. Because in your interview, you're, you're setting up with a relationship with somebody they know what the lesson's going to be about because you have made a contract with them for that. So the, the two are a little bit different to each other. In awareness through movement, when you and I are very robust and capable of getting on and off the floor and not overly injured in any way, we can afford not to know and go into that abstract realm of sensing our movements. And then at the end, when they have their discussion or when you're having a conversation with them, sure, you can let them know. Or you can even ask them like Alsa Hanke does up in Sydney. What do you think this might be about for you? Where would, the, where would these movements, now this, this is not, where would these movements appear for you in everyday life? Now that's, that's a take home thing, right? Is that a question coming up? No. <laughs> yeah. So this business about actions and the relationship between the two, it's uh, they're still they're still arguing about this. Certain scientists believe it's the control of movements that's important, that's got promise in the other ones are more action. Depends on whose camp you sit in, but notice that there's lots of different points of view. And that's what's so tricky about doing the Mythbusters thing. There's so many different points of view. And uh, in this lesson, I've, I have combined in this lesson all the different variations I could find that had to do with jello pudding straight up and straight down. Yeah, because that's about... It's about uh, seven different jello pudding lessons. And, and a lot of them have this and this and this ingredient in it, but not the others. And then some others have that and that and that and not the others. So I've taken the ingredients and I've done, okay, which ingredients fit together so that everything is head, foot, head, foot. And then tomorrow or Monday will be another one. And then there'll be another one. So know that you can do that. You don't have to teach the lesson. So long as it has like an action, when Kevin goes to drink water, when he, if Kevin's thirsty and he goes to get water, there's an intent there. 
if your intent is to explore this kind of oscillation through the body and everything you do is clarifying that, solid. Just like this morning when you were doing all of this, what's the intent? How much can this person find here so that when they go to walk, they're able to maintain their balance irrespective of what they walk on? So a clear intent allows a lot of improv, a lot of improv. Not a clear intent, eh, could be good fun. <laughs> you never know what might come out of that, but it's a little bit different. Now I have one more video to show you before we finish. And this is the skeleton, the, 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 the supermodel skeleton, multi-man bungeeized skeleton. So that you can see in this model, thanks for the glasses. <laughs> it would have been gone. Okay. Okay, Mr. Skeleton, where are you? Videos. Bruce Lee, no. Dancing Together, no. Edelman, no. Uh, Tennis player, gorillas, not, oh, not there. Interesting. Okay. Must be on the other stick. Ah, there it is. No sound. Here we go. Thank God your neck is not like the skeletons. But you can see there's an intention here to build some sort of model that in some fashion or other shows how force propagates through a skeleton. Where's the force coming from? The person's hands. He's supplying the force. Now, of course, in, your, in yourself, you supply intrinsic forces produced by your muscles. In FI, it could be a little bit of you and a little bit of them or all of you and none of them. But that movement wouldn't be happening unless there was sufficient friction between the back of the pelvis and the mat that that pelvis was on. If that was a completely slippery surface, this wouldn't be happening. It would look different. So that pelvis is being rolled. Can you see how it's traveling? And particularly notice... Notice how the hip joints travel that way and then that way, that way and then that way. Can you see that? Especially when I get my finger out of the way. And then there's another movement. The hip joints are not just going that way and that way. They, they go up, forward and back, forward and back. Yeah, they get lifted higher off the ground. You see that? And... The chin, is it going towards the throat and away from the throat? Is something happening in the ribs? Is the spine changing shape? Is there movement in the collarbones? Sort of. You see the movement of the ribs relative to the scapula? Yeah. If you, if it, if, it, if, it, if it works for you, I know it works for me, if you can develop in your mind 
based on all your awareness through movement experience and a little bit of knowledge of the skeleton as it's articulated, you can have a working model in your mind of how the skeleton would move if you did a certain movement. You know, if you did that, you could say, oh, spine goes this way, ribs flare there, that comes there, that hip joint, what happens with that hip? Oh, that ball of the hip joint comes up. Okay. And with that model, when someone does something in front of you, you can compare the model in your mind of how a skeleton possibly could move with what the person's doing. And there's the information. Oh, model, person, model, person. And then you can go and investigate. So that's one way into, an, into a lesson. But this is the lesson you're going to do now. Jello pudding. Except he got no jello. <laughs> He's got no jello at all. He's all just skeleton. What do I mean by that? I'm giving you a clue, by the way. When you get it just right, your viscera are going to move around. Yeah? Those organs are going to s not quite slosh because they are suspended in connective tissue, but they will have this quality of a jello. If you over muscle it, no, they won't. Okay. So please have a break. Get yourself ready for an awareness through movement lesson. And uh, we'll take it from there.